Please stand for reading God's words. Today's passage is from Genesis chapter 24, verse 1 to verse 9. Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I lived. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Shall I take your son back to the land from where you can? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I'll give this land. He will send his angels before you, and you will take my, a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Can we close our eyes and can we pray for a minute, please? Lord God, our Father in heaven, as we come to the time of the preaching of your word, we ask, Father, that this time be your time. Let it be you that people turn to, that they listen to, that they love, that they know that you are there and that you wish to guide them and give them wisdom, Lord, that, they, that you love them beyond anything they will ever understand in this world. Let them turn to you, Father, and let them hear your voice speaking to their hearts. But my words, let my words be the words of a fool, let them be clumsy, let them be broken, let them disappear into the air, except that they give glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been looking at the book of Genesis as part of the Gospel Project series, which you're doing in the Sunday school classes. We've gone through the first 11 chapters, which has talked about the creation, the fall, about the flood, about the Tower of Babel. And from chapter 12 onwards in the Bible, we see that God focuses on using people to bring back people to Him, that God has a plan for doing this, and it focuses on particular people. Some of them are extremely well known. Abraham, for example, he was the first person that we've looked at, and we looked at him and his son Isaac. And today we're looking, continuing to look at uh, Abraham, but also that somebody who was connected with uh, Abraham, so we're looking at chapter 24, verses 1 to 4. We start off and it reads, Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for, your, for, uh, for, your son, for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now, when we read this sort of scripture, we've got a right to be able to ask questions of the Bible. Nobody ever asks you to turn off your mind to stop thinking. When you read the Bible, think about it, ask questions of it. And here we have some obvious questions like placing his hand under the thigh. To, uh, as a part of a swearing, part of the swearing process. This is not part of our modern culture to do this, but it's something that they did a long, long time ago. We don't have a lot of references for it, but it seems that this is a way that they chose to, to swear, like we would put a hand on the Bible and make an oath. His way of doing it was like this. Other questions we might choose to ask would be a simple one. How old was Abraham at this time when, he, when it says that he was very old and advanced in years? We looked at it last week when we talked about the birth of uh, about Isaac, and we know that uh, Abraham in his life, he was 74 years old when he left Haran, when he left his family and his culture. He was about 86 years old when he tried to have a son through another woman, through Hagar, and that was Ishmael. 
Um, but the son that God had chosen was Isaac, and he was born when, uh, when Abraham was about 100 years old. And now Ab Isaac has grown older, and he's looking for a wife. Abraham wants his son to marry. From verse 20, we know Isaac was 20 years old uh, when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethel, the Aramean of Padaram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. So 40 years old, that would mean that Abraham at this time would be about 140 years old. So he's really getting on in years. He's quite a lot older than I am. I once asked some students when I was teaching English, these elementary school students, how old they thought I was, and they said, are you over 100? I thought this was a very unkind question to ask me. <laughs> but Abraham is definitely older than I am at the moment, 140. And he's asked, looking for a son, for his wife. Why? Why did he ask his servant to do this, to find his wife for his son, for Isaac? Well, very simply, God had promised, he had made a promise that he would bless all nations through Abraham's descendants. To have descendants, you need a wife. Very simple fact of biology, that it, Isaac needed to marry, so it needed to go from Abraham to Isaac to the next generation and on to be able to bless all nations. It meant that a Isaac needed to marry. Um, and he was getting older. He's getting 40 years old, which is an age at that time that you should be married. Now, he gave some instructions to the servant that it was not to be a Canaanite, not to be from the culture that he was living in. And we talk to Christians in the same sort of way. Paul says, he says, do not be bound to unbelievers. Be bound with unbelievers. When you look for a husband, look for a wife, it's better that you marry Christians. If you marry somebody who's not a Christian, you're setting yourself up for trouble. And here, the same situation. If he married into the Canaanite culture with his idolatry, with his practice of human sacrifice, with all the things that were going on within a Canaanite culture, then he is likely to be led in corruption. So Abraham gave him a clear instruction. Do not find a wife from among the Canaanites. And the servant asked a question. He said, the, um, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Shall I take your son back to the land from where you came from? He says, instead of the servant going, he can't find a woman. Well, let's take Isaac along to, this other, to his family, to this original country that he lived in. But Abraham's answer was very clear. That Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back to him. That he is not to take Isaac back to his original family, to his original land where he came from, where his, the rest of his family was. Um, he was very clear about this. One reason, I believe, was because it was, there was an instruction, that I, the uh, promise that God had given, that God had said to him. He said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And for him to possess it for his future generations, it meant to occupy it, to live in the land, to become part of that land. And so it was important for him to live there. I think that that was one reason that he wanted him to live there, because this is the land that would belong to them in the future. But I also think there was another reason. Because when we look at Isaac and we compare him with Abraham, we compare him to his son Jacob, and then later Joseph and these sons, Isaac doesn't appear to be a very strong person. We don't have anything sort of where it says he's a strong person. It, says that it, it suggests that Abraham was very protective of him. He sent Ishmael away so that perhaps Ishmael was the dominant person. And later Abraham had other sons and he gave them gifts and he sent them away so that God clearly worked through Isaac and there wasn't a question of dominance from other sons or competition with other people. We also know that he was very attached to his mother. And this three years later, he seems to be actually very unhappy that his mother is dead. Three years, he still seems to be depressed about it. And this seems to be one reason why he's looking for the wife. And perhaps if he went back to this family, he would be too comfortable there. And he'd say, I want to stay there. I saw a movie about a woman, an Irish woman, who went to New York, married there, and then went back to her home country of Ireland, and it was so comfortable that it was really tempting to sort of say, no, 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 I don't know anything about New York. And she almost wanted to stay in Ireland. 
back in her home country. And that's for many of us. If God takes us to a place, it's always very tempting to say, no, I was much more comfortable in this other place. So this is why, perhaps why Abraham was so clear, don't take him back there. And we know that the servant did make this oath. The servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So he made this oath. Who was the servant? We don't know. He's nameless. If you want me to guess, I could probably guess that it's Eliezer of Damascus because he seems to be very important, that he would have inherited from Abraham if uh, Abraham hadn't had the son Isaac. And so perhaps, there was, perhaps this is who it is. But we really don't know. It's a nameless person that Abraham is sending to find a bride for his son. Now, when we look at the book of Genesis, when we look at the Bible, there are some personalities, some characters that are very important, very strong characters. Abraham is one such person. He's a very important person that God called him a friend, that God loved him, that God led him, that God spoke to him. And yet we also see other people in the Bible who still have a relationship with God, but it's not so clear. Now, when you look at me, I have to tell you the truth. You're not looking at Abraham. One is because I'm not so old, but the other thing is I don't have the relationship. I wasn't called the way that Abraham was called to bless all nations through his descendants. I wasn't called in that way. And the servant, he perhaps belonged to God, he knew God, he loved God, but he wasn't called in the same way. And for many of us, it's the same thing. And so when we're looking at this story, when we're looking at chapter 24, we're not so much looking at Abraham sending the servant, we're more looking at this nameless person that could be me, that could be you, that could be any of us, because many of us are nameless to the world. If I send a birthday card to Donald Trump, he doesn't know who I am. And so, instead of saying Abraham, instead of focusing on Abraham sending a servant to find a bride for his wife, instead I would like to focus on God. That God leads a servant to find a bride for Abraham's son. And that's the relationship that I want to look at. The relationship between God and this servant. But this relationship is how God is fulfilling his purpose. Through people that we don't know the name of through people that the world will say are not particularly important, through you and through me, that the world doesn't know, and yet God still uses us in a special way to complete His plan. So God leads the servant the way that He leads us to fulfill His purpose, and He uses us in a special way, and we have a relationship. Even though the world the, few, the thousands of churches around the world, the Christians around the world, don't know my name and don't know your name. But God does. And He does use us and He does bless us. So I want to look at that relationship of, God, of the servant setting out with God leading him to find a bride for, for Isaac. And we read about the servant. The servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. So we believe that he was in Hebron at the time that Abraham sent him. And he traveled here, a distance of about 500 kilometers. This would have taken him about a month to travel there. Now at that time, it wasn't a very safe place. There's lots of robbers, there's lots of criminals, there's lots of people. He's traveling with all these camels. Camels are valuable. They're extremely valuable. Last century in America, I used to hear that they had the death penalty if you stole a horse. And so animals used to be much more important. Now we focus more on machines. But having those 10 camels, having all these good things, meant that he was traveling with wealth and traveling for about a month, maybe to an area that he didn't know well which meant the relationship between them was one of God, where he trusts God to take care of him. And God does. That he succeeds in traveling this 500 kilometers, this month-long journey, and he isn't robbed, he isn't murdered, he has God's protection. The same as in our life, we are called again and again, trust God, and he will lead you 
trust God and He will protect you. And he went to the city of Nahor, and then we read that in verse 11. So it jumps immediately from he left Abraham, and then the next verse, it's a month later, and 500 kilometers away. And it said, he, the servant, made the camels kneel down outside the city um, by the well of water at evening time, the, women, uh, when the, the time when women go out to draw water. Why then? Why at this particular place? Because once again, God. You go to a particular place because God led you there. Why did I come to this church? I have no special feeling about this church, but this is the place where I was baptized. This is the place that God led me to. This is the place that God led me to and made me a member of this church and caused me to grow and to get to know people and to help other people to grow. But it wasn't me. I didn't look at this church and say, yep, that's a nice-looking red church. I'm going to go there. It was God. And many times in your life, you go to a place because God leads you there. He leads you back to Taiwan if you're in America. He leads you to study. He leads you to go away. He leads you to, do, to take jobs in different places. It's God's leading. And this is the relationship here that we follow as God leads us. And this is what we always want to do, to pray to God for God's leading that we can follow as He leads us. And we read that when He reads, reaches this place, He does this. He said, O oh God, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. What's He doing? He's just arrived. He's traveled 500 kilometers. He's hot. He's dusty. He's dirty from the road. First thing he does is find a hotel and get a sleep and have a shower. And the first thing he does is he prays. And this is important because he recognizes the importance of that relationship with God, that it is God that led him there, God that protected him. He's there because of God. Abraham sent him. Abraham gave him the words and said, go and find a wife for my, for my son to fulfill the promise of God. But it is God that is with him, God who is leading him, God who is protecting him. So the first thing he does when he gets this place, he prays. And this is what we should do as a church. We talk about the uh, announcements earlier, and we do the announcements of saying, let us be a church that prays. Not just because we will need to go through the announcements, but because prayer should be central to our life as a church. Prayer should be the center of your life as Christians. That no matter what happens, when you set out on a journey, you pray. When you arrive, you pray. When God gives you something, you pray. And so this is the first thing he does. He prays, and he says, Behold, I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming down to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jaw so I may drink, and who answers, Drink, and I will water your camels also, may uh, be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Now that's a very specific prayer. I want to find a woman to marry, or for, uh, for my son, I want her to be wearing a red dress with a blue flower and a purple scarf, and he gives a very exact description of what he wants. He wants a woman who is kind. He wants a woman who is showing hospitality. He wants a woman who shows a particular type of attitude, a particular type of character. But he asks not for him to most find the most good-looking woman, or the woman who seems to have the nicest smile, but he prays and says, guide me. Show me where you want me to go. Show me the person that you have in mind for me to bring back for Isaac to marry. He prays for guidance. And this is what we should be doing, that we should always be praying, Father, lead us, guide us. If this is what you want me to do, make it obvious, make it clear. If you don't, then close doors, close it so it's not possible for me to do this. But if this is where you want me to go, help me to know this and make it clear. So we pray for guidance. As a church, we should be doing this. As Christians, we should also be doing this. As this service has done, as this servant is doing. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born of Bethel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. And we see that when he prayed for guidance, in his case it was immediate, 
that God provides. And we find the same in our church. Maybe not as quickly as this, but God is there. God loves you. God wants to provide for you. He wants to provide for us as individuals. He wants to provide for us as a church. It may not be what we're expecting. It may be something very different. But God's plan is always best. So we have a right to pray for guidance, saying, show me, lead me, and wait for God to provide, to answer our prayer, to show this is the direction I want you to go in. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me uh, drink a little water from your jar. She said, drink, my Lord. And uh, she quickly lowered the jar from her hand and gave him a drink. Now she, when she had finished driving him a drink, she, also, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. This is a strong woman. Ten camels. Do you know how much water where ten camels are going to drink? It's a huge amount. They're supposed to be able to drink like 50 gallons each at a time. That's a lot of water. And the way the well was set up was that she would have to go down steps and then bring the water up again. But she's a very interesting woman. Now she emptied the jar into the trough for the camels to drink and ran. She's very energetic and ran back to the well to draw the camels uh, and she drew for all the camels, for all his camels. This is what he had asked. He said, this is what I want. Show me if this is the way to go. Guide me for the woman. And he asked, gave a very specific promise. Now for you, I don't know because you maybe not be praying for what God wants you to do. But if you feel in your heart that this is what God wants you to do, if you feel some people come to me and they say, well, does God want me to go to America to study? Well, there's nothing in the Bible against it. And if you feel that this is the right thing to do, as long as you're not leading into sin, if you pray about it, I'd say go with your heart. But here he's given a very specific thing. He's asked very specifically, give me this sign. Now for us, maybe we don't get a specific sign like that. But we know what the Bible says. Most of the way we live our life, most of our instruction for how to live is in the Bible. And we know what's in our heart, that God is leading us. But be careful. Don't be tricked by your heart as well. Don't say, is God leading me to marry this woman? Well, I think she's really cute. So God obviously must be leading you to me to her. Maybe not. <laughs> so be a bit careful about it. But the man, the servant, is still not sure. And it says while Rebecca was doing this, while she's getting the water to give to the camels, it says, meanwhile, the man, the servant, was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. He's still not sure. Is this the woman? And the only way to ask her, perhaps, is what is in her heart. Will she accept? And the way he does this is he approaches her and says, when the camels have finished drinking, the man took a gold ring. When we say a ring, it's not for the finger. It's for the nose. <laughs> So it'll refer to it later, a nose ring. It was a custom at that time. Women would wear a ring through their nose. Um, and so he gave her a gold ring, a gold nose ring wearing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing 10 shekels of gold. That's a lot of gold. That's very valuable that she's wearing on each wrist. She's wearing a bracelet. That's a gift from him and the gold ring. As soon as he gives her this, she thinks, this is a lot of watering some camels just for water. And so she knows something is going on. And he speaks to her and says, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there a room for us to lodge in your father's house? So he's asking for hospitality and he wants to know. Abraham says, said, find somebody from my family. She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milcah, who was born to Nahor. Uh, again, she said, we have plenty of both food, a straw and feed and room to lodge in. So she identifies, she says, I am from Abraham's family, the instruction that you were given. I am from this family, and we can take care of you. We can give you hospitality, both for your animals and for you. And we know who, they, who these people are when it talks about Bethel, Milcah, Nahor. If, we, if you look back in verse 22, sorry, chapter 22, it talks about the family of Abraham. It introduces them. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, behold, Milcah 
has borne children to your brother Nahor. Um, so Nahor is probably about the same age as Abraham. He's probably up around 140 years old if he's still alive. And he's not mentioned here, so he's probably not. Uh, Uz, his firstborn, and Bethel, um, who was also a son. Um, and Bethel became the father of Rebekah. So if we look at it, we have Abraham, who's the same generation as Nahor, then Bethel, and then Rebekah is the next generation. But because Isaac was born when Abraham was very old, the age is probably similar. She's probably 25, something like that, in her 20s. He's in her 40s, so probably be 15-year age gap between them, 10, 15 years age gap between them. The servant, when he hears this, when he knows who this woman is, once again, what's he going to do? When he found out this woman has done what he asked her to do, she's, obeyed, she's followed the signs that he asked for from God, and she's from the family. The man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. Once again, we see him praying, giving thanks that God has led him there, that God has provided this woman for him, that uh, the woman that he used to take back to Isaac. And so he prays, and he says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth towards his master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way of the house of my ma master's brothers. We can, we pray. We should be praying for guidance. We should be praying for God to lead us, for God to guide us. And when he does, don't stop to say thank you. Don't forget to say thank you. You remember in the New Testament where Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one of them came back to say thank you. So when God does work in your life, when God does give you things, when God does lead you, when he does guide you, when he does protect you, when you know his presence, when you know his love, when you know his care, stop and say thank you because he loves you. And it's right for you to love him back and to thank him for the grip of the things that he has provided. The story goes on in chapter 24. The girl ran and told her mother's household all about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran outside. So he's the brother that we'll see again later when we talk about Jacob. He becomes a more important character. Uh, and Laban, the brother, said, Come, blessed of the Lord. Now, notice the word he's saying here Lord means Yahweh which means although they probably worship idols, they recognize that this man was a follower of Yahweh. Blessed of the Lord, blessed of Yahweh. And they probably recognize him in a special way. We don't know that their relationship with God, but he did recognize this. And when he says, blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside since I prepared the place and the house for the camels? And they went inside, and the first thing they do in the Middle East, hospitality, is they eat. When food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. And he said, uh, Laban said to him, speak on. So he explained, I am Abraham's servant. And he explained everything. When you read the chapter, it's a very long chapter because he keeps saying the same story over and over again. The, a, the um, servant explained everything that had gone on. And then he asked the question, and now if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or the left. If you're going to give me your daughter to take her back for Isaac to marry, let me know. Otherwise, I will go another direction. Obviously, this is not the right place. This is not the right way. I will find another way. And the answer from the family... Then Laban and Bethel replied, the letter comes from the Lord. It comes from God. They can see it, that God is working through this man. So we cannot speak to you bad or good. It's God. And so asking us, we're not that important. It's God that's leading you. God is directing this. And even this family can see that it's God. And so they say, this is God that's leading you. It's not us. It's not our opinion. It's God that's leading you. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. And in response to this, what's he going to do? Pray. Then Abraham's servant, when Abraham heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. He had already asked for guidance in prayer. He had already given thanks in prayer. And there comes a time when all you want to do is worship 
that you know who God is. You know His power. You know His love. You know that He is there. You just want to be with Him. And we don't know the words that you, He said to, to God at this time, but I think they were just saying, just recognizing who God is. God all-powerful, God all-knowing, God who loves and guides and protects. That he prayed to him, first in guidance, then to give thanks, and now simply in worship. Later, then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they rose in the morning, he said, send me away uh, to my master. He wanted to go immediately back the next morning. But a brother and mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, stay, say 10 days after she may go. But he wanted to go straight back because this is what God had led him to. Sometimes when God is leading you, you don't want to stop because God has said, do this now. And so you don't want to delay. The world says, wait. But you say, no, God is leading me, so let's do it now. He said, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. Notice what he does here. He says, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. He gives the reason. But when he's saying it, he's giving the credit to God. He's not saying it's me, it's my intelligence, it's my brilliance, it's my good looks, it's my skill with dealing with people and with negotiating. It's God. God has done this. And this is what we should do. When the church grows, we give credit to God. When we are healed, we give credit to God. When we are comforted, we give credit to God. Throughout our lives as Christians, always we should say, it's God that's leading us, God who provided. God has brought us here. For me, as a pastor in this church, I've told you before, I can't understand why I am here, except God led me this way, and God put me in this position. And all I can do is say, I'm here because of God. And in your life, if you turn to follow God, it's the same thing. Give credit to God that he will lead you, that he will guide you. The family, they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, uh, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. And so he goes back. And we read about his returning. Now, Isaac had come, uh, uh, come from going to Beer, La Haroi, he was living in the Negev, Isaac went out to meditate in the field. Now that word is only used once in the whole Bible. It appears we don't exactly know the meaning. It seems we guess that he was actually very unhappy. It's mourning, depression, because he's still sad about his mother's death. Abraham went out to meditate in the field toward evening and he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, camels were coming. Rebecca lifted her eyes when she saw Isaac. She dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, he is my master. Then she took a veil and covered herself because this is a custom at that time. Then Isaac brought her into his mother's, Sarah's tent. Mother, his mother is now dead, but he's, they still had the tent. They still have everything. And she took a place in his life that his mother had. She became the woman, the one that guided him, the one that was with him, the one that gave him advice and loved him. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his death. And when you follow God, God gives us peace. We know that this is the right way for us to go, that this is the love that God has shown for us. This is not just about this nameless person, but this is about our lives our relationship with God, that we trust and God protects, that we follow and God leads, that we pray and God provides. We pray for guidance, we give thanks in prayer, and sometimes we simply worship knowing who God is. And we don't look to ourselves and say, me, I did everything. It's God. God leads us and God does the things in our lives. This is the way we should be living as Christians in same relationship as this servant, this nameless person, the way that he lived. I'd like us to take a moment and close our eyes and look at the way that we do live. Do we follow? Are we like this servant, this nameless person, in our relationship with God, following as he leads, trusting him, praying, giving credit to God who loves us? Can we take a moment in prayer?
Lord God, our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you are God. You are God who loves us, God who cares, God who we can follow, God who protects us, God who gives guidance, God who provides, God who gives peace. You are God, and we are not. Let us give our lives to you, Father, as sons and daughters who love you, because you loved us first, and you gave us your Son. And we thank you so much for all of these things. And as we pray, perhaps there's somebody here in this church who wants this peace that God provides, this wisdom, this leadership, this guidance that God has, but you don't have this yet because you haven't accepted Jesus into your life. But something is speaking to you saying, this is the time, this is the place, this is the day that I want that love. I want that guidance. I want that relationship with the Father, a Father who truly loves me. If that's you, then simply understand who you are, a person who has done bad things, the same as all of us has done, and these have separated you from our God. But Jesus died to pay the price for everything you have ever done and ever will do. All you have to do is accept the gift of forgiveness and love that he offers you to simply say yes. If there is anybody who wishes to accept this offer today, simply raise your hand and let me lead you in a prayer, a prayer to accept God into your life. Is there anybody here today who wishes this relationship with God? Anybody, just raise your hand. Pray this prayer in your heart with me. Lord God, our Father in heaven, I accept that I am a sinner. I have done bad things and I have thought bad thoughts. And these things have separated me from you. But I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he died on the cross to pay the price for all my sins. I confess here and now that I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I give him my life and I will follow him from this day on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.